In 1844, in Philadelphia, an anti-Catholic orator named Louis Charles Levin was elected U.S. Representative from Pennsylvania's first district. It was a modest win and seemingly insignificant in the grand scheme, but with one exception. He was the first candidate to emerge victorious from the Know Nothing movement. The Know Nothings, also known as the Native American Party, were a xenophobic political movement that arose in the 1840s in reaction to a huge influx of Irish Catholic and German immigrants. Native-born Protestants saw these immigrants as job stealers and a threat to American culture and religion. Secret societies were common in America at this time. When members were asked about the group's activities, they were told to say they knew nothing. The name stuck, but in 1855, they stepped out of the shadows and into the political spotlight to form the American Party, demanding immigration restrictions and a 21-year residency requirement for citizenship. They appealed to farmers and mill workers and laborers. In 1856, the Know Nothings chose former President Millard Fillmore as their nominee. He finished third, winning just 21.6 percent of the vote. The American Party splintered within months. Today we'll hear from Professor Rafael Ditella about his case entitled Populism in America, Fake News, Alternative Facts, and Elite Betrayal in the Trump Era. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Rafael Ditella is an economist whose areas of interest include, among other things, corruption, crime, happiness, and political economy. And I think all of those things sort of surface in this case we're going to discuss today. Rafael, thank you for joining me. Thank you for the invitation. So this was a, uh, for me, a great education. This is a term that we're hearing increasingly. We've heard it a lot over the past year with the new administration. Uh, and, you know, people say populism, but I don't know if they really know what it means. So if they read this case, they'll get a much deeper understanding of it to begin with. So what prompted you to write the case? Well, um, so I, um, I've been interested in populism for a long time. Part of it is uh, due to my uh, country of birth. I, I was born in Argentina, mm -hmm. and I've studied a lot of, of Argentine politics, and, and Latin American populism is, of course, a central aspect of it. I'm also interested in macroeconomics, and a lot of imbalances are due to things that we economists call populism derogatorily. So we just say that's like a, they're irrational or mm. silly or weird things. And I've always been interested in trying to put some structure to what populism means. It doesn't seem like a random collection of thoughts. That's not a very academic conclusion from looking at populist experiences. And that's mm. what I was trying to do for a long time. You know, there have been all these uh, populist uh, tendencies in Europe and in the U.S., and I was interested in studying them. And we, we did a, a paper with a, a colleague of mine, with Julio Rothenberg, um, yeah. and we we had a paper. And then we, you know, just prior to the Trump election, because we thought not that he was going to win, but we thought he was going to be very, very close. And so we did a, a paper with data from the weeks uh, prior to the election. And uh, so that was the idea. The idea was try to, to use some of the notions we got from populism more broadly in Latin America or in other countries or Africa even uh, to see if we could understand aspects of American populism or populism in richer countries. Yeah. And, and I want to come back to a question as we get further into the discussion about, you know, why this matters to MBA students, because I want to sort of hear how you're thinking about that in the context of what we teach here. But before we do that, can you just, I mean, is it easy to define populism? Can you just put a... Put well, a definition to it? So one aspect, just to be concrete, is that they have views about institutions in ways that you wouldn't have in a standard left-right competition. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of anti-institutions. Sometimes they lift checks and balances, yeah. uh, populist candidates. Another element is that they're anti knowledge or anti things that in standard models of political competition, you would think it's a good thing to be more competent. Mm -hmm. And we see you know, over and over, populist candidates that are seen as less competent, not more left or more right, but just more silly. Populism involves a whole different way of thinking about what are the relevant constraints. That's the, the closest I can get to a yeah. definition. They have a different take on what the constraints are from what the established wisdom is. But the way you describe it, it sounds like there is a fundamental belief there that things are different versus I think a lot of people may perceive populists to be simply playing on the emotions 
of people who are insecure about their situation. And if you look at the past election, it was said many times that, you know, President Trump during the campaign was simply playing on people's fears. Uh, and that's where all of this immigration policy stuff was coming to, to the fore. So so I guess my question is, are populists, is, is it a derogatory thing? Is it a negative thing all the time? Or can a populist emerge who really does have fundamental beliefs that are in the best interest of, of certain people? I don't really connect too much with the idea that these people are exploiting emotional weaknesses in ways that are weird or unusual mm -hmm. in politics. Politics is all about providing narratives that make sense to people, and those narratives naturally produce emotions. We have all these views about people being rational on all these domains, like you know, when they buy stuff. Like you know, we think the markets work because people are rational on so many ways. And suddenly when it comes to politics, we decide to assume they're not <laughs> rational. That seems not very you know, scholarly. Yeah. That's, so that's why I think it's better to think about how come these people have those emotions? Why is it that they feel insecure? Mm -hmm. And would a rational person connect with that? And I think that's the easiest way to do it. I think we've overplayed how much we understood the yeah. consequences of globalization. We've oversold them in big ways even when we understood that the benefits would be concentrated and the cost would be, you know, would hurt lots of people, we just went along with the idea that there was a potential yeah. for compensation that we have no idea whether it was going to happen or not. In fact, we suspected there was no mechanism at play to produce that redistribution from globalization mm -hmm. um, or for greater openness. The elites kind of you know, pushed for it. I'm a person who kind of connects with that part, so I certainly like more open markets, etc. But I understand that it's a preference, not that it's a scientific knowledge that I'm carrying. Yeah. And I think it, you know, economists have overplayed that card. And, I, and people's fears and emotions and anger is connected to that. And I think it's correct. It's a correct anger. So do you see uh, sort of globalization as one of the uh, the bedrocks upon which this whole – it seems like we are in a populist movement in many parts of the world – uh, is globalization sort of at the core of that? I think in part, uh, yes. But more centrally, I would say, is that this idea that educated people look down on people who don't share our views about globalization. And I think part of the anti-globalization movement is upset about the idea that they cannot really contest uh, our ideas about globalization because we look down on them as if they were stupid mm -hmm. or, or if they were illegitimate or if it's just a lobby, yeah. as if the alternative was not a lobby. It's like absurd. So we have, I think it's a, a part of a democratic deficit that we have in the conversation. And with a strange supernatural status for knowledge that we have given yeah. in economics, which is a social science, and we certainly don't have that much knowledge. We, we really are exaggerating on, on the status that we insist on giving ourselves. Yeah, and that, you know, that's part of the label that's been slapped on the elite, and it's part of you know, the anti-intellectualism that we saw surface during the campaign. The case gets into the sort of fake news, this phenomenon of fake news. Can you talk about some insights that you gleaned about how fake news factored into the rise of populism here? So I'm very interested in the media, and I've done some research connected to that. I've noted in other countries, before talking about the U.S., that there is this split in what people end up believing. When you study those aspects of how come people in certain countries come to believe such different things, there's so much polarization, typically economists dismiss it, oh, it's countries with lots of inequality or this or that, etc. And I don't think that's correct. I think there is a, a key element of how democracies work and function is with trust. Mm -hmm. And um, a central aspect of the trust component of how these places work is the media. The media is how we get a lot of information, etc. And when people start suspecting that the media is biased, um, I think they, they see the media as an ally of these intellectuals or this pro-globalization cheerleaders, whatever, that they dislike that. And mm -hmm. they think that the media is not calling it straight. But it's true also in other countries. So I wouldn't call it part of like the American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's part of uh, everywhere. The idea that when there's a breakdown in trust, how am I getting my information becomes crucial. And I'm very nervous about who owns the media. And if anything, outside of the U.S., it's a bigger concern because there's fewer independent media outlets. Yeah. So I think my interest in putting the media at the center of this case was to make readers uh, aware of how fragile 
the equilibrium is where mm-hmm. we trust the media. It's very easy to disrupt that. And I think the Fox News phenomena here is in a small scale, believe it or not, what has happened in other countries. And I think it's a very difficult question for the future. How are these media markets going to evolve? Particularly when you have all this uh, financial pressure on mm-hmm. these media outlets. Right. Well, and, and candidate Trump, as well as several of the other Republican candidates, were calling the media out throughout the campaign and questioning the validity of the media and continue to do so to this day. So you've got a president in office who has said that the media is the enemy of the American people. Yeah, uh, That's a pretty powerful statement, and that certainly fuels distrust and lack of confidence in, in the media. There is a, at some level, sometimes intensely, sometimes marginally, but trust is a component of this connection. So when that begins to break down, because they're reporting things that, they're not reporting the things that are happening to you um, the way that you see it. You know, this equilibrium where we have a lot of information being produced begins to get destroyed, and then you get just opinions. Yeah. And then these opinions, of course, can make the problem even worse. And with social media as a platform, everybody's opinion can be heard in a much bigger way than it could before. Big time. One of the issues with the lowering costs of producing information is that more outlets can survive, certainly in the U.S., but they are more targeted to their readers. An interesting poorly understood fact is that people like reading stuff with which they already agree. (laughs) So if I, you know, I'm trying to figure out if you're trustworthy or not. And one of the ways I do it is by figuring out on the things that you're reporting that I already know whether you agree with me or not. So that's, that's, I think, part of the element of the models that explain this in a deeper way. But, but you're exactly right. You know, the mistrust of the media, which is being compounded by social media. So uh, let's go back to the business context around this case and why do business people need to care about this? I work in this unit called the Business Government and International Economy Unit. And the premise for our unit is that it's important for business leaders to understand the business environment. And there are many examples that we can provide where you can make a decision about how to sell red pens versus blue pens, et cetera, that you know, changes the bottom line by X percent. But if you did not understand there was a devaluation of the currency coming, you missed out on something that is a thousand times more important than getting the right marketing of, or the accounting or this or that. Mm-hmm. So there are many examples where understanding the business environment is central, and this happens outside of the firm. Our focus is everything that happens outside of the firm. And there are these changes in taxation or the privileges of business that are happening around the world, and I think those are connected to populism. And and if you miss on that, you really are running very big risks. A lot of the companies that were in countries that went through populist experiences, really, uh, some did extraordinarily well, Mm -hmm. and some did extraordinarily bad. And I think the ones that did better are the ones that had a more sophisticated understanding of what populism meant and the likelihood of success. It's very typical for sophisticated people in companies to dismiss populism because it's something they disagree with. But they don't understand that (laughs) they have only one vote. (laughs) Yeah. And there's many other people who disagree uh, with that. Anyway, so predicting populist movements, even though it's extraordinarily difficult, I think it's an advantage. And I think part of what I wanted to do with the case was to make students think about how many things about the business environment in the U.S. could change with a populist candidate. Yeah. And, of course, we are in the throes of the first year of the Trump administration. Uh, Business has been booming. The stock market is hitting record highs. Everybody is feeling really jubilant about where we are today. Uh, but uh, many of the policies that this administration wants to enact haven't really taken effect yet. So I guess the jury is out, so to speak, on how U.S. businesses will fare. Yes, although if we are being honest... We have to be honest. We have to be honest. <laughs> if, you know, it's always an option. Right? <laughs> but if we are honest, not many people thought this was going to be the outcome for the first year. And we, you know, If you read, and I have the documents. If you read what people were saying on all the news you mm-hmm. know, and their speeches, etc., was that this guy was uniquely unqualified to run the, co- the, the and that included, I guess, the economy. So mm-hmm. if that was true, then you know how come one could say, well, it, who cares about stock markets? They're all driven by weird sentiment, etc. But like you know, I think that would be superficial to do. I think there are elements that are going well, I guess. And I think there's a lot of expectation about these reforms that might help business mm-hmm. uh, because he is very strong. You know, the president has very strong views about how uh, how to do that. Look, let me just be clear about my position. I don't particularly like some of those policies. But if I like them, 
than if I take this microphone and I pull my Harvard pedigree and start pontificating about these are bad policies. Mm -hmm. It's extremely easy for people in this position to, to start confusing my preferences with what I know. I certainly don't know that these policies are going to be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. you know, I, they look like they're going to weaken uh, yeah. the U.S., I think. And to your point earlier, what you said, these are, these are assumptions, and people behave differently sometimes in the way we assume they're going to behave. You've discussed this in class? Yes. So I'm just curious, because we have a very global student population here, does it take on emotional tones? It's hard to, uh, to read about populism, I guess, without feeling kind of emotional about it. Well, I taught it only once uh, last year in my course, my second year uh, elective. Before the uh, for MBAs. post-election. Post-election. Yeah. So I only did it uh, with MBAs just for that time. And MBAs at that point were understandably, you know, shocked and surprised, etc. And we had a conversation which wasn't, you know, was very emotional and difficult and strange. And I think my conclusion at the end was that a lot of people had spoken during the class as if it was a given that everybody else should agree with them at how bad uh, Trump was. And mm. I thought that was uh, a strange assumption, that we had never done that before. That we always, even with cases that are of countries where you know, things seem to go wrong, you always see the other side. And I think we were more blind to the possible virtues of Trump in, in class than what I thought we were in other cases. Yeah. So that's, that was interesting. Um, I have a different teaching plan for this year, which I'm working on. So we'll see how it goes. Great. Rafael, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. You can find the populism case along with thousands of others in the HBS case collection at hbr.org. If you enjoyed this episode of Cold Call, please subscribe on iTunes for more cases like this one. And while you're there, please write a review. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call.